everybody and a very warm welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs here in New South Wales. We at the Institute pay respect to the Gadigal people, traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and to all the other Indigenous peoples of Australia. They are custodians of knowledge and learning begun more than 70,000 years ago. We join them in the search to understand and care for our world. Our event tonight addresses the issue of the voice, and we have two experts, ex expert speakers on that subject. We're going to hear essentially about what our speakers believe Australia can learn from other countries, and also the effect of the issues surrounding the voice on our standing with other countries, both of those being important international issues. Our first speaker here in the hall with us tonight is Associate Professor Harry Hobbs, an experienced constitutional and human rights lawyer working at the forefront of debate about Indigenous state treaty making. He's going to speak for half an hour to us here in the hall, and then we'll be joined via Zoom by Dr. Ed Wensing. Dr. Wensing is an experienced planner, policy analyst, an academic working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities across Australia on a wide range of land and water related matters. And that's quite enough for me. It's now over to Harry Hobbs. Thanks everyone. I, I'd like to uh, thank Ian and the Institute as well for their generous invitation. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. I haven't come down um, to Kent Street before, but it's a really beautiful building. And it's so lovely to see so many people here in person uh, and online. I'm just gonna get my phone so I can time myself. So I don't wanna... Uh... <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, so I too would like to start by acknowledging that we're on the lands of the and waters of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also extend that respect to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are here with us today in person or online. I think it's always really important uh, to explain why we do an acknowledgement of country. I, I don't, I, I, one of the reasons I do it, I suppose, is because um, as, a, as a lawyer, I think it's really important to note that it was members of my profession uh, who were responsible for setting up the framework for this country. Uh, I have an obligation, I think, to deal and to reckon with the fact that I was members of my profession uh, that spent many years justifying the denial of the rights and interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. As an Australian, uh, I think uh, that I was the beneficiary of those practices, and I think it's important to reckon with that as well. Uh, and I think all of us really need to consider and deal with how we engage with that. Later this year, there'll be an opportunity to make a clear statement uh, that we're committed to doing something differently and to engage in this question. I, I really do thank you all for attending tonight, whether you will vote yes or no or unsure at this stage. It really is incumbent on all of us to engage seriously with the proposal, to understand where it comes from and what it might mean for this country. I hope to help in that endeavor tonight. And in my short talk, I'm gonna explain where the idea of voice came from, uh, what it would do, why it's important, uh, and what should be constitutional. Uh, given my audience though, I'm gonna also focus on the international, uh, international angle. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sweden, Canada, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, and explore about, uh, explain a little bit about what they've done in relation in the relationship with their indigenous peoples. I only have 25 to 30 minutes or so, so this will all be quite brief. And I note there are a number of experts of, from Canada and Aotearoa, New Zealand and, and, and elsewhere around in the audience tonight. Uh, so I am very happy, of course, to take any questions and to explain things in a little bit more detail. Australia is at a turning point in its history. Uh, later this year, we, we, we will be required to vote, uh, and yes, it is compulsory for all citizens, in a constitutional referendum to make a very significant change to our nation's rulebook. The question we'll be asked to vote on is whether or not we support the alteration of our constitution to establish an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. As you may know, the constitution has only been changed eight times in its history. It's 123, 123 year history now, so this will be very significant. It's also significant for the focus of the proposal. This will be an advisory body made up of Indigenous Australians. They will be empowered to make representations to the parliament and the government on matters that relate to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The notion of an Indigenous voice may be new to many people, but it's not a new idea. The call for a First Nations voice has a very long history and its origins can be traced back a long way. 
It is a fact of history that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities were not accorded the rec uh, respect and recognition when the British arrived in 1788. But things did not get better quickly. No Indigenous Australians were invited to participate in the drafting of our constitution. The views and interests of the peoples whose connection to country stretches some 65,000 years were not considered in the drafting of that document. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have long advocated for reform to the Australian constitution to recognise their unique status and rights. In one of the most famous uh, proposals, one of the most famous petitions, sorry, in 1937, Yorta Yorta man William Cooper gathered 1,814 signatures for a petition to King George V, calling for Indigenous representation in the federal parliament. And just to think about how difficult it would have been to find 1,814 signatures for a petition in 1930s, 1930s. Uh, but he did. The petition he managed to send all the way to Prime Minister Joseph Lyons. Uh, cabinet refused to send the petition to the king. They didn't tell William Cooper either. The 1967 referendum moved us along a little bit. Section 5126 of the Constitution gave the Parliament the power to make laws for the people of any race except Aboriginal people. This meant that only states could pass laws about Aboriginal people. Frustrated, discriminatory and paternalistic state laws, Aboriginal people sought protection from the Commonwealth. After many years of campaigning, they were finally successful. The referendum in 1967 amended the race power, giving the Commonwealth Parliament the power to make laws with respect to Aboriginal people, as well as the people of other races. Since 1967, successive federal governments have recognised the need to engage and listen to Indigenous Australians. There have been three government-established national Indigenous represented bodies to perform this function. The National Aboriginal Consultative Committee, formed in 1973 and abolished in 1976. The National Aboriginal Conference, formed in 1976 and abolished in 1985. And the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, formed in 1989 and abolished in 2004. In practice, each of these bodies struggled to be heard. Governments routinely ignored, sidelined, repealed and or abolished these initiatives at whim, especially if they gave advice the government did not like. All three of these bodies, as I said, were abolished after several years. So the abolition of ATSIC is a really fundamental point uh, or inflection point in the contemporary debate on constitutional reform. But the impetus, in my view, has its origins in a 1997 High Court decision, Cartanieri and the Commonwealth. That year, the Howard government passed a law to build a bridge to High Marsh Island in South Australia. A group of Naringeri women challenged the law, arguing that it would destroy their cultural heritage. This is the secret women's business that you might remember. The court was asked whether the amended race power meant that parliament could only enact laws for the benefit of Aboriginal people, or whether the parliament could also enact laws that discriminated against Aboriginal people, or adversely discriminated against them, say by destroying their cultural heritage. The court ultimately ruled in favour of the government. The bridge would be and was built. Although the court did not definitively resolve the broader question, the outcome is that parliament can pass laws to adversely discriminate against Aboriginal people on the basis of their race and Parliament has done so at least four times in the last 30 years. I think this is really important because in many countries around the world, there are constitutional provisions that say you cannot discriminate on the basis of race. Our constitution is the only constitution I can find that says you can do it. And it's only ever been done against Aboriginal people. For many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the promise of the 1967 referendum was broken by this High Court decision. Since then, they have sought structural reform to better respect and recognise their rights and interests. But it was not until 2012 that the idea of constitutional recognition really re-emerged on the national agenda. As part of her negotiations to form a minority government, Prime Minister Julia Gillard set up an expert panel to consider whether and how to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution. Over the years since, and this is since 2012, there have been over or more than a dozen detailed reports, several parliamentary committee inquiries and a number of expert panels. These have been oversighted by five uh, or six now prime ministers and leaders of the opposition. Initially, following that 1997 decision or in line with that decision, the view from all of these expert panels and reports was that the race power should be amended. As I said, most countries around the world have a provision that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of race. Indeed, every Commonwealth country has national human rights protections in place, except one, us. Right? So not only do we have not have a Bill of Rights, but we have a constitution that says Parliament can discriminate on the basis of race. So the view was, we should change this. However, this has happened in 2015 now. The Federal Coalition at that time explained that they could not support a constitutional amendment that it would involve judges assessing whether a law benefited or discriminated against Aboriginal people. 
So they said, if you want constitutional reform, we should do something differently. We don't want judges involved in it. Australia's constitution is a political constitution. We don't have a Bill of Rights. And so the coalition's position was we shouldn't have a one cause Bill of Rights. You know, so it a particular protection on race, but not on other human rights issues. So the coalition said, we don't want judges involved. So Aboriginal people went back to the drawing book and they said, well, what can we do that's different? What can we do that leads to structural reform to better respect and recognize our rights that doesn't involve judges? Yeah? So they sought a different approach. And in the 2017 Uluru Statement from the Heart, they called for a voice. They asked to provide input in the design and development of law and policy at an early stage. So this would avoid judges and lawyers. It would also enhance our democracy by ensuring the people affected by a law would have some say over its design. The Uluru Statement is a really significant document. It's the culmination of a series of regional dialogues held in every state and territory. And, and again, Aboriginal people weren't involved in the drafting of the constitution. So this is the first time that they've really had a say or a chance to debate what should be in the constitution. The document was also, or statement was also issued to the people of Australia because it's the people of Australia who can vote to change our constitution. I believe it is a very generous invitation from First Nations peoples to walk with them in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. The statement calls for the ancient sovereignty of First Nations peoples to be recognized through structural reform including constitutional change. Now, in their mind, structural reform is needed to give First Nations peoples greater say and authority over decisions that affect them. This means making real changes to the way decisions are made and by who, rather than tinkering with existing processes of decision-making and control. So a lot of people I talk to about this say, well, why does it need to be in the constitution? The parliament can pass a law tomorrow that says there will be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Why should it be in the constitution? What's special about the constitution? I think it's a really good question. And I think there are three reasons in my view about why it needs to be in the constitution. The first point is the voice is an advisory body. It will have the power to make representations to the parliament and government. There is no obligation on the parliament or the government to listen to those representations or to act on them. There's no legal obligation on parliament or the government to respond. The strength of the voice relies on public support. That is parliament and the government will listen to the voice if we, the Australian people tell them we think they should treat it with the seriousness it deserves. And we can do that in a referendum because it's an up or down, yes or no vote. It's not anything else about other party political considerations. It's not in general federal election. It's yes or no, whether we think the voice is important. Second, as I briefly noted, there's a long history of previous First Nations represented bodies. These have been set up in legislation or by the executive. This means that they could be and were easily abolished by government when they tired of them. Setting up and then abolishing representative bodies cuts across progress. It damages working relationships and it wastes talent that could be used to solve complex problems. It also fuels cynicism and distrust. Why would you get involved in another process if the last three, four, five have always ended in failure after the government tires of them? Yeah. So in the regional dialogues, many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples said they were frustrated with this chopping and changing. And they said they want a long lasting and durable voice in policy and legislative decisions that affect them. That's why it needs to be in the constitution. The third point is that putting the voice in the constitution is an act of recognition and respect. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have more than 60,000 years of connection to this continent. So putting the voice in the constitution would mean that the Australian people formally recognize that history and status. It's also the form of recognition that Aboriginal people have asked for. Over the last de decade and a half, we've been debating about constitutional recognition. To my mind, it makes little sense to recognize someone in a way they don't want to be recognized. It's the voice or not, voice or nothing really. But let's pause for a moment and take a broader view. The UN estimates there are around 470 million indigenous peoples across the world. That's about 6% of the global population. Indigenous peoples call 90 countries home and they represent around 5,000 different cultures. Unsurprisingly, Indigenous peoples are diverse and pluralistic, crisscrossing geographies, languages, cultures, faiths and politics, as well as personal socio-economic circumstances and perspectives. What is common, however, is that all Indigenous peoples have and continue to experience colonization, or colonial intrusion. International law has gone some way to respond to colonialism. Under international law, Indigenous peoples have a right to self-determination. This right is directed in two ways. First, it's a right to exercise control and autonomy over internal and local matters, a right to self-government within communities. It's also a right to be heard in the development and design of legislation and policy that affects or relates to them. 
a right to have their voices heard in the processes of government. These rights are set out in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a formerly non-binding legal instrument that Australia endorsed almost 15 years ago. Almost 150 countries have now endorsed this declaration, so it has broad international support. And in many countries, states have developed their own ways to empower Indigenous peoples to have their interests considered on law and policy and to have their right to self-determination respected. One way is through an Indigenous representative body. That's what we're going to vote on in a referendum later this year. Indigenous representative bodies also exist in Scandinavia, South Africa, and New Caledonia. Generally speaking, these bodies are separate from the ordinary parliament, but are constitutionally or statutorily incorporated into the parliamentary process and empowered to advise the parliament or government on certain matters. Another approach is by imposing an obligation to consult when considering conduct that may impact Indigenous people's rights. This is the approach in Canada. It has also been part of the debate in Australia, but is not part of the current proposal. A third, but by no means final approach, is via political engagement through treaty uh, and designated seats, sorry, within Parliament. This is the approach in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The Uluru Statement also called for Makarata Commission to supervise agreement making and truth telling. So treaty is also part of the conversation in Australia, even though it's not the focus at the moment. It is important to bear in mind when making comparisons that the context of each uh, of these examples is quite unique to the countries. And while some insights can nonetheless be drawn from the experiences, we do need an Australian solution to an Australian problem. So with that disclaimer, I'm going to discuss briefly the approach in Scandinavia, focusing on Sweden, uh, Canada, and Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, and as I said, very happy to answer questions at the end, because I know this will be quite brief. So I'll start with the Sami parliaments in, in Sweden, Norway, and Finland. The Sami are Indigenous people whose traditional land stretches approximately 600,000 square kilometres across northern Scandinavia and the Kola Peninsula in Russia. Although their lands are claimed by four states, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia, the Sami are one people residing across national borders and share language, culture, and customs. Colonisation occurred differently in Scandinavia from Australia, but with similar results. In Sweden, for example, Sami lands were considered unowned. Because many Sami practiced reindeer herding, Swedish law developed on the fiction that they had no interest in their country because they simply migrated over the top of it. Colonisation has also left the Sami a minority in their own lands. The Nordic countries do not collect statistics on minority groups, so there is no precise data about numbers of population here. But uh, estimates suggest that there are around 50 to 65,000 Sami living in Norway, around 20 to 40,000 in Sweden, 8 to 10,000 in Finland, and another 2,000 in Russia. So we're talking about a very small population here, proportionately, right? In the late 1970s and 1980s, the Sami people struggled for recognition and gained international attention. In what is known as the Ulster Conflict, Sami and their allies staged massive protests against the construction of a hydroelectric power plant on the Ulster River in northern Norway. So again, the same sort of time around the Tasmanian Dam controversy in Australia. Although the power plant was eventually built, it put the issue of Sami rights onto the political agenda. A few years later, Norway had established the very first Sami parliament. A few years later, Sweden and Finland had established their own Sami parliaments. Uh, Russia still has not. The three parliaments that exist provide the Sami people with a formal access point to the processes of government in Norway, Sweden, or Finland. Elections are held every four years, and all Sami may choose to vote to elect representatives of their choice. It's not compulsory. Like the proposed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, the Sami parliaments have no power to veto legislation, but they may comment on bills and thought Sami interests are considered by their respective governments. Unlike the proposed voice, the Sami parliaments also have a role in administering certain programs and services related to Sami people and their culture. Because the voice won't have a service delivery role or program delivery function, I'm going to put this aspect to one side. I mean, the question of everyone's lips is, do the Sami parliaments work? Do they make a difference to the design of legislation? Does the government listen? Sometimes, right? In 2009, for example, the Swedish government introduced into parliament a draft bill aimed at bringing Swedish laws into conformity with the International Labour Organization's Convention 169. The Sami parliament heavily criticised the draft, arguing that it failed to implement the convention properly. The government withdrew the bill and announced its intention to substantially revise the proposal. Just a year earlier, however, the Swedish government proposed to add the Sami to a list of minority groups whose rights are protected in the constitution. The Swedish Sami parliament once again challenged this, criticising it, saying, well, we are Indigenous peoples, not minority groups, and we want you to adopt that particular language. The government chose not to. In other words, the Sami might not always be successful in influencing government, but their representative body means that their interests are at least considered by the parliament and the government. And this may not happen otherwise when they are a very small demographic population in the country. 
Now, of course, there is some way to go. The Swedish government acknowledges this. In 2017, it declared that it does not always consult with the Sami parliament appropriately. I think Norway offers a good comparison. Under Norwegian law, governments and public authorities must give the Norwegian Sami parliament an opportunity to express an opinion before they make decisions on matters relating to Sami people. This applies to all matters that may affect Sami interests directly, including their culture and land ownership rights. It also covers all forms of decision-making, including proposed laws, regulations, administrative decisions, guidelines, and government reports. So it's really broad. Consultation must be genuine and effective, and it may include consideration and debate by the Sami parliament. It does not extend to a veto, but cabinet documents have to indicate what the voice thought of the proposal and whether its views were taken into account or not by the cabinet. Once again, the results are mixed, but it does give the Sami living in Norway a real say when decisions are made over about. I also note that the Norwegian model is more extensive than what we are considering and will vote on in a referendum later this year. But let's move on to Canada. I always find Canada a very useful comparator to Australia. Right? It's a federation that is also home to hundreds of indigenous communities that sh and it shares a similar colonial history and common law foundation. It does have a slightly larger proportionate indigenous population than Australia. First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples comprise around 5% of the population, as opposed to 3% in Australia. Despite these similarities, the legal and political relationship between Indigenous communities and the state in Canada is very different. When European powers first arrived in what is now North America, they negotiated agreements with the Indigenous communities they encountered. These peace and friendship agreements to share resources, encourage trade and strike military alliances developed into treaties. There are now 70 historic treaties that the government recognises that form the basis of the relationship between the Crown and some 364 First Nations or Indigenous nations, sorry, in, in Canada. Now, these treaties were not always honoured, yeah? but they recognise the status of Indigenous communities as possessing land rights, as possessing a right to negotiate, as possessing sovereignty. Of course, this was not recognised in Australia. Now, vast areas of Canada were never subject to treaty making. And in 1973, the Supreme Court of Canada changed the game. They held that Aboriginal title existed outside Canadian law. The Canadian Crown may need to negotiate to obtain rights to the land. This decision, called on Attorney General of British Columbia, sparked a modern of a modern treaty era. Since then, 25 more treaties have been signed that include self-government powers, and treaty making continues to this day. Now, it's not a lot since 1973, only 25. So there are complications with the process. But again, it, I think it, it's really important that it it evidences, I guess, an attempt to come to terms with colonization. I should note also that modern treaties are far more complex to negotiate than historic treaties, right? They're more legally complex and they're struck against a background of broken treaties. So they're, hard, they're much harder, right? The Supreme Court has drawn on the treaty relationship to develop a fiduciary duty called the honor of the Crown. In fulfilling this duty, the Crown has a duty to consult uh, and, where appropriate, accommodate First Nations views when contemplating conduct that might adversely impact potential or established Aboriginal or treaty rights, which are protected by the Canadian Constitution. The standard of consultation differs in each circumstances, but in all cases, consultation must be meaningful and performed in good faith with the intention of substantially addressing the concerns of the affected Indigenous group. Now, the duty to consult only applies when the government is contemplating conduct. It does not apply to the Parliament. But in 2021, the Canadian Parliament enacted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, which establishes a legal framework aimed at a Cana aligning Canadian law with the UN Declaration. The Act requires the government, in consultation with Indigenous peoples, to develop and implement an action plan to achieve the objectives of the Declaration and table an annual report on progress. The action plan must include measures to address injustices, promote mutual respect and understanding, and ensure accountability for meeting its implementation targets. This federal law builds upon the efforts of British Columbia, which enacted a similar law just two years earlier in 2019. So to bring it back to Australia for a moment, in the case of Canada, we have a constitutionally protected duty to consult, which requires the government to engage with Indigenous peoples when contemplating action that might affect their constitutionally protected rights. And in two jurisdictions, we have legislation that extends that by requiring laws to be brought into alignment with the UN Declaration, which includes a right to be consulted in the design and development of laws. Once again, this is more extensive than what we are going to vote on later this year. What about New Zealand? The relationship between Maori people and Indigenous, not, uh, indigenous New Zealanders is governed by the Treaty of Waitangi. The treaty was signed in 1840 by many, though not all, Maori chiefs and representatives of the British Crown. Under the treaty, Maori signatories 
uh, signatories ceded governorship to the British Crown while being promised that their full authority over their land, people and treasure would remain undisturbed. However, for many years, the treaty was simply ignored and the Crown alienated Maori land without considering their interests or providing compensation. This approach reached its zenith in 1877 when Chief Justice uh, Prendergast dismissed the treaty as a simple nullity. From the 1950s, however, Maori activism focused on changing this dismissive state attitude towards the treaty. Maori and their supporters called on the government to honour the treaty by making good on past promises and rectifying past wrongs. In 1975, the Waitangi Tribunal was established as a permanent commission of inquiry to investigate past uh, injustices and past uh, instances of broken treaty. And so the in relation to Maori claims that they've been prejudicially affected by legislation or Crown action inconsistent with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. The tribunals and decisions are not binding, except in very limited circumstances, but they carry political and moral force. Its recommendations inform and help propel direct negotiations between Maori and the Crown aimed at addressing and rectifying breaches of the Treaty. Today, the Treaty has legal force only to the extent where it's been incorporated by Parliament into statute. As Matthew Palmer, a judge of the High Court of New Zealand, notes, this occurs in about 25 pieces of legislation other than treaty settlements. So the courts have explored what this means. What are treaty principles? Yeah. And they say that uh, the references to principles of the treaty require consideration of the underlying obligation, the underlying responsibility, the underlying idea of the treaty, rather than in specific terms. But they say there are at least three core concepts, partnership, active protection, and redress. The principle of partnership includes obligations of parties to act reasonably, honourably, and in good faith. Courts have also suggested that this requires the Crown to take positive steps to actively pursue redress of uh, for grievances of the breaches of the treaty. The principle of active protection ensures more direct authority, emerges sorry, more directly from the text, of the text of the treaty in the form of the Crown's promise to guarantee the authority of the Māori and protect uh, their lands and resources. Finally, as the Waitangi Tribunal has found, the principle of redress requires the government to act so as to restore the honour and integrity of the Crown and the manner and status of the Māori. Government ministers must also consider the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. The New Zealand Cabinet Manual requires ministers to draw the attention of Cabinet to any bill or any aspect of a bill that might have implications or may be affected by the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. So again, here we have a treaty relationship built on principles of partnership, active protection and redress. These principles require careful consultation and engagement. Principles of the voice is hoping to embed in Australia as well. I should note here that New Zealand also has a system of reserved seats for Māori people that has operated since 1867. This is not part of the Treaty of Waitangi, but a piece of legislation aimed at giving Māori a more direct say in Parliament. Now, the voice would be a, a voice to Parliament rather than in Parliament. So again, a more limited measure. And uh, so just to conclude, I suppose, where does this leave us in Australia for the debate going forward? The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice is a sophisticated and considered proposal that she seeks to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples can participate in the democratic life of the state. And it does so in a manner consistent with our constitutional system. The voice is also a simple request from a people who have a 60,000 year connection to this continent and whose rights and interests have too often been ignored. It is a plea to be seen in the constitution and heard in the processes of governance. A brief examination of examples overseas suggests the voice is also a modest reform. It does not compel consultation like Norway. It does not impose fiduciary duty like Canada. It does not entrench reserve seats like AFR. It is an advisory body that will provide an opportunity for Indigenous peoples to have their voices heard in the design and delivery of law and policy that affects them. It is an opportunity to do things differently. We all agree that laws and policies work better when they are developed with the input of those on the ground who will be affected by them. The voice will encourage this, and in my view, it will thus contribute to better outcomes. At the same time, as Robert French, the former Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia notes, the voice really is a once in a lifetime opportunity for Australia to fill a gaping hole in our constitution. The fact that it says nothing about the peoples who are still here today and whose ancestors have cared for this continent, as I said, for more than 60,000 years or more than 3,000 generations. The referendum then is an opportunity for Australians to walk to accept the invitation offered in the earlier statement from the heart and walk with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to build a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm joining you from Canberra on the lands of the Ngunnawal, Ngambri and, um, and um, 
Ngargaragu people, um, and I acknowledge they have never ceded their sovereignty and uh, and they've had their land stolen from them and these matters are yet to be resolved. Um, I'd just like to add a couple of quick observations. Look, I agree entirely with, uh, with Harry's presentation, excellent presentation. There are just a couple of observations I'd like to make in addition to that. Um, in the international context, the UN talks about Indigenous and minorities, um, and also um, there are a couple of other examples that I think I can add to the mix. Um, in South Africa, for example, um, there, they have the National House of Traditional Leaders, which consists of 18 members elected from the provincial houses of traditional leaders in the six or seven provinces in South Africa that have um, traditional leaders. And the role of that body is to um, ensure that it operates in a manner prescribed in its statutory mandate, promote the development of rural communities, work together with other primary stakeholders in the execution of its mandate, and participate effectively in legislative and policy processes. Um, Germany has a, a minority council, or, uh, sometimes referred to as, I hope I get the pronunciation right, the Minderheiten Secretariat. Um, there are four recognised uh, auto autochthonous um, national minorities in Germany. Um, that word draws from the old Greek word for native to the soil and the place where it is found. And they are the Danes in South Schwelwig, the Frisians, the German Sinti and Roma, and the Lusitanian Sorbs. The Lusitanian Sorbs. Um, that body plays a significant role in representing those minority interests in the German parliament. And prior to every federal election, they um, uh, are able to prepare what they call election benchmarks, which they then hold the members um, to after election. So they play a pretty important role. Singapore is another Commonwealth country that has a council of minority rights, but unfortunately it operates in a very um, confidential way. So it's not possible. It has 21 members at any one time. They're appointed for a lifetime um, and their dealings are all confidential. So we don't know exactly how they operate, but they are intended to ensure that the Singaporean minorities um, retain pretty much um, power and control in Singapore because of course the majority population in Singapore is Chinese. Um, so they're just a few other countries that I think are also worth putting into the mix. Um, I also just wanna make a quick, a couple of quick observations about um, uh, uh, that Pat Anderson was co-chair of the Uluru statement made. And it was a comment that um, Harry also made in his presentation and that is, yes, it, we can certainly learn, and, and as a comparative researcher, you know, we look at, at other countries to learn lessons from what they've done successfully or not done successfully. And that's all well and good. But Pat Anderson made the observation in a recent public seminar that Australia needs an Australian solution. We have an Australian problem here. Um, our, um, our history of terra nullius and denial and dispossession of Aboriginal people of their country and denial of their culture and their language and their even um, not even counting them as people until the constitution was changed in 1967 is a terrible history that we have to live up to and, and accept. And the second point that Pat Anderson made is more of a personal one. She says that when you go into the ballot box at the referendum, it's between you and your, con your conscience about how you will decide to vote. And I echo uh, Robert French's comments. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a change to our significant, a significant change to our constitution. And if I can just give a personal example of that, um, I recently just, one of the reasons why I couldn't come to Sydney tonight was because I got called in at very short notice by Peter Yu, who's the vice president of the First Nations portfolio of the ANU, to assist with the preparation of a um, discussion paper for a conference on indigenous water rights, which is being held today and tomorrow in Canberra. And in the, in the course of preparing that paper, in the absence of a voice, Peter has had to call together an interim Indigenous reference group of about 12 or 15 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from across Australia. And I had about five days to write this paper and another five days to consult with those 12 people to make sure that I got the content right as far as their views were concerned about um, Indigenous water rights issues. So that just goes to show you a, a very practical example of um, why an institutional voice arrangement at a national level is vitally important. One of the other reasons why, of course, is that even in the environment portfolio, um, Tanya Plibersek is undertaking a series of consultations with Indigenous peoples on a whole range of fronts, the National Water Initiative, um, heritage protection reform, 
uh, you know, national parks, native title matters, other environmental matters, the review of the EPBC Act, for example. And yet every time she meets with Indigenous peoples, it's generally the same people in the room every time. Um, and so it's really important that we do provide some kind of um, organised institutional arrangement at the federal level that can be an effective voice for Indigenous peoples in national policy and legislative development. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have the best part of half an hour for questions from the audience. Please wait for the intern with the microphone to reach you. Who would like to start the ball rolling? Got a question here in the front. Microphone's just been turned on, so be here. Uh, hold on. Oh, sorry, just wait. Here it is coming. Sorry. <laughs> Was um, yeah, John Hallam, and uh, I have also been on a government advisory body that got abolished. <laughs> um, look, um, what is the risk that we all vote for this thing, it gets up, and then we say, okay, um, Nothing more needs to be done. That's all that, um, that 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 needs to happen, and go back to sleep. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't see that. Um, it's just in terms of a matter of, of politics of, of evolving in that way. I think if the voice gets up, and the voice there'll be a, a really groundswell, I guess, of, of support and, and and sort of goodwill and good faith that the voice will succeed and work. Right. I guess what would happen then is that. The order of statement calls for three reforms, a voice, a Makarata commission, they will then supervise group making and treaty. And so the idea, I suppose, is that the voice would then work with government to help develop a Makarata commission. And they would say, well, what would the Makarata commission look like? What would its mandate be? Who'd be part of it? How would it work? How would it integrate with the territory, the state and territory treaty processes that are ongoing now? I mean, one thing I think not many people are aware of is that every single jurisdiction in Australia, except for Western Australia, has formally committed to treaty talks. And so the Makarata Commission will then need to integrate those existing processes at state and territory level. I think uh, in terms of what is the risk that the voice will fail, I think the challenge is that, like everything in life, it relies on the people who are part of it. I think um, the voice will need politically astute individuals who know when to press and when not to press. They'll need to make sure that the advice they give to government can be work can be implementable and workable and is useful advice to government. At the same time, they'll need to make sure that it also reflects the aspirations of Aboriginal people. It can't be more limited or more conservative, maybe, than aspirations, than the you know, totality of those aspirations. There'll be a tension between whether the government can use the advice and it's seen as successful and working, uh, and at times when it needs to be sort of pushing further. So it needs the sustained support of Aboriginal people as, as part of it, as well as the sustained support of Australian people more broadly. So I don't think the voice will end, sort of end and be okay. We've done it. We've we've signed on to it, and now we can move. We can all relax and pat ourselves on the back. Reconciliation is done. I think the voice will be a stepping stone to a better Australia, I guess, a better future, because it is an enabling or you know, speculative um, reform rather than an end point, uh, and it will give kind of Aboriginal people a, a better and Torres Strait Islander people a, uh, a I guess a, a better opportunity to to speak their mind and have their aspirations considered and heard in national debate and in Parliament. Thank you, though. And apologies for your abolished position. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I, there's no risk that, that the voice will not be um, heard at one point or another in time. I don't think it'll become a dormant body. Like I was just looking through a copy of the Constitution. I think the Constitution calls for the establishment of an interstate commission which I don't think has met for about 50 years. <laughs> I, I don't think that's likely to happen. Um, you know, the state is here to stay. So are Indigenous people. Indigenous peoples have not um, have not stopped speaking out about their rights um, ever since they decided, you know, like William Cooper did back in 1937, fairly consistently. There have been about 11 or 12 major declarations since that time for things like treaty and recognition of land rights. That's not going to stop. They're not going to go away. These are realities that we have to deal with. And if we're not prepared to confront them as a nation, then we should be ashamed of ourselves. Next question. Okay. 
Thank you for that really informative talk. Can you give some on the ground examples of how the voice might be used, like in specific policies or legislation? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think a lot of people say, well, you know, how will the voice work in practice? How will it, what change will it make? And I suppose uh, we can see lots of examples where the voice could make a difference in Australia. Uh, to me, the biggest example would be, I mean, <clears throat> we see, I, I guess, the, the sort of folks in the last few weeks or last few months have been in Alice Springs and, and, and issues around the cash and debit card. The voice is an opportunity, I suppose, for Aboriginal people to say, look, um, you know, here are our representative leaders. Here are people we want to talk to, you know, who have connections in community and we respect and we uh, say, you know, go forth and talk on our behalf, rather than maybe people who have their own particular um, barrows that they want to push and they don't, might, might not have that same connection or that same um, um, community uh, relationship. And they'll say, okay, well, what is it working or not working in your community on the ground? Uh, and the, the advice may be very different depending on different places of the, of the country, right? And so the advice might be that we want X to happen in the cash step card or Y to happen in the cash step card. I mean, one example, I guess, is, is kind of just that sort of practical that practicality or practical element. But really another example would be the push now around the states and territories to raise the age of criminal responsibility. We see that Victoria said that uh, committed to doing so to the age of 12. I think international law says the age of 14 is where the age of criminal responsibility should be. It's at 10 in most jurisdictions. This, again, has been something that people have said, please change for many, many years. The voice of the opportunity to continue to press government to say this is important to us and we want you to make a change. One other example would be relating to um, recommendations around the Royal Commission um, that Aboriginal in custody way back in 1991. This is one of those recommendations. Um, but you look back at the history of recommendations that have been implemented uh, and the vast majority still have not been implemented. So I think one of the things that you see in, in, in this space is that we know what the solution is. The solution is to ask Aboriginal people what they think is important and to listen to them and try to engage with them. Now they won't get everything right, people always get things wrong right, but they'll do a hell of a lot better than not listening to them has done over the last 200 and something years, in my view. Yeah. Um, that was a very good question. Um, I can give a much more practical example. Um, I just completed a project about a year ago looking at the future of local governance in the Central Darling Shire in Western New South Wales. Now, Central Darling's been in administration for over a decade. Uh, not because of incompetence, but basically because the current model of local government in far western New South Wales doesn't work. One of the pieces of work I did was to look at Aboriginal governance in the in the region that encompasses Central Darling in western New South Wales. And what's been in existence for over 20 years is a body called the Murdy Parky Assembly. It is not constituted under any Australian law. It is constituted under Aboriginal law. When ADSIC was abolished, um, in 2004, the two regional councils that used to be in that area um, disbanded as bodies under ATSIC because that legislation was being repealed. And instead, the local communities decided to create their own um, First Peoples Assembly effectively. And so Murdy Parkey has been in operation now for 20 years. Of course, it's supported by Commonwealth funding principally, but also money from the state. But the way it operates on the ground is that in each individual community on the ground, they have community working parties, which are constituted by the Aboriginal community that resides in that locality. And they decide their priorities and their priorities are fed up the line to the Murdy Parkey Assembly and the Murdy Parkey Assembly assembles those and then forwards those to the Commonwealth and state governments. Now, the funding doesn't come to Murdy Parkey to deliver the services. It's not constituted. It's not it's not registered as, or incorporated as a body, so it can't receive money. But there's a there's a constituted body that accepts the funding to make it work. But essentially, the business of Murdy Parkey is run by the Aboriginal community itself. Now, if the voice arrangement materialises at the federal level, there's no reason why that at that regional scale and at the local scale, you'd do anything to replace what's already in existence, because that's what the local communities have already had in place for some time, and it works for them. So that could order, that could quite easily feed up to the national voice arrangement. So there are a couple of other examples like that around as well, but that, that's the best model currently that's working pretty well out west. Um, how many Aboriginal communities are there with their own language? I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not sure how many. I mean, there's one of the challenges, obviously, with colonization is that there are Aboriginal people in different parts of the country experience colonization at different intensities and different times. 
uh, and it really mm. damages uh, relationships and, and, and communities. And so languages can be lost. Mm. Languages are being recovered at the moment. Um, so particularly in South Australia, there are a number of universities that are engaging in a lot of language revitalization projects. Similar things happening in Tasmania. Um, but I guess the, the challenge comparison we always have in versus New Zealand to Aotearoa New Zealand is that there is one language group, one, one sort of community called Maori people, and they constitute about 15% of the population of New Zealand. So it's much easier to engage in, in, with one larger population in that sense. Obviously, there are different iwi, different hapu, but uh, one larger polity. In Australia, it's different. There are many, many uh, hundreds of communities. Uh, so in Victoria, I think there are around 38 uh, First Nations communities. Uh, in Queensland, I think there are almost maybe 150, I guess, or 100 or about, uh, around that. They're all sort of engaging now about how will they engage in treaty making, for example. I guess the question to some degree is how does that then relate to a First Nations voice or an Aboriginal Torres Strait voice that will only have 24 mm. members? So, you know, the, the composition of the voice has to be small because it can't have 200 people or more as part of it. Again, that's something for Aboriginal communities themselves to work out how they want to be represented. Uh, that's not for us as non-Indigenous uh, Australians to, to tell them. Uh, and assuming the referendum is successful in, in October or November or wherever it's held, the government has said that they'll have a six-month process of consultation where they will most likely, I don't know, but most likely take the Langton Karma report to community and say, here's basically what they start at the starting point, what works, what doesn't, how would you like to see this evolve? This will then come back to parliament, uh, come back to the government where it will be drafted in legislation. I imagine it will most likely go back to communities again to make sure that they're still happy with what it looks like. It will then be subject to a parliamentary committee report where all of us can put our thoughts on what we think about it. Uh, and then it will be uh, sent presented to parliament. Uh, how will it look in terms of the composition? We don't know at this stage. Mm. But I mean, I should say, you know, I don't think we should be scared about that. You know, I really don't. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, there are about, there are about 1,000 to 1,100 remote isolated communities spread across Australia, um, principally in Queensland, Northern Territory, Western Australia and South Australia. Um, so about 1,100 of them, very small, isolated remote communities. And that was that's largely due to the, the homelands and settlements arrangements that, that precipitated after the land rights, the statutory land rights schemes were instigated across most of the other jurisdictions. Or they were remnant missions or reserves that were managed by churches or states. Because everybody's going to have to deal with those complications, right? The parliament was, mm -hmm. So there's a debate now in the parliament, uh, it's under the radar at the moment, about whether we should expand the size of the parliament to better represent, uh, better reflect the population of Australia. So this is always something that we have to engage with and deal with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. I'm hoping that we have a very positive outcome. However, I am concerned that everything that we've heard so far is about that the parliament, even if the, the voice is established, doesn't have to take the advice provided by Aboriginal people. Is there any way legalistically you can see that between that legislation may be developed with the support of the government and the Greens or the crossbenchers as well to ensure that the if there was a change in government that they would be forced to listen to the voice? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a real question because it's people are surprised to often hear that the voice will be an advisory body only and won't force government to listen. Government won't be required to. That's a reflection of our Westminster tradition of government, where we have a parliament, parliamentary supremacy, parliament supreme, um, so no one can tell parliament what to do. Parliament can debate any bill it likes and can do so in any way that it likes. Previously, before I started at uh, my PhD, I worked in the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, whose job is to basically investigate and examine every bill that passed by parliament and assess it against its human rights standards that Australia has endorsed and accepted. Um, the committee couldn't stop parliament from passing a bill if the bill was going to breach human rights. The, the parliament the government will just say this breaches human rights and we don't care that's fine that's parliamentary supremacy uh the people and election will decide whether they like that or not in terms of is there legislation that can be drafted that can force or compel parliament to listen or the government to engage mm -hmm. uh so yeah there, of course legislation can be developed that says that government should engage or executive ministers should engage or the public service should engage again because parliament is supreme parliament has control of its own procedures it can pass any law that it likes as long as it's subject to the constitution so parliament could pass a law that says we think that the government or ministers or departments should engage with the voice when they're drafting laws or developing policy ideas that relate to Aboriginal people. They could pass that law. 
There is a similar bill, a similar law right now, the Legislation Act, Section 17, that says whenever an administrative rulemaking is making a law relating to particular people, uh, they need to consult with representatives of that group. So if, if they're making a law related to some sort of disability accessibility arrangement, they need to talk to the peak sector in the disability organisation. They need to do that. If they don't do it, Section 19 of the Act says no legal effect. It doesn't matter. The, the law is still valid. Yeah. So I imagine there's something that might happen similar. It doesn't compel government to respond, but there's, I guess, a legal obligation that says, yes, you shouldn't do this. We want you to do this. If you don't do it, so what? The Parliament could pass a law that says we want the government to listen to the voice and engage with the voice and respond to the voice. But if we decide later that that doesn't work very well, another Parliament could just amend that law. Yeah. So have numbers to do it. you've always got the numbers, right? So I think one of the good things about our constitution, and I, you know, we talk about international affairs a lot, obviously, in this organisation, I think um, we have the power to, to, to change it and parliament's in control of it. So I, I, look, I think a Bill of Rights would be important, but I think um, ultimately the people should have their say whether they think that the parliament's getting things right or not. And so this is, I guess, another aspect of that for a referendum. Yeah, I, I agree entirely, Harry, with your comments. The, the observation I would make is going back to your presentation, you noted that Australia is one of the very few nations in the world that doesn't have a national human rights framework reflected in its constitutional or even in its legislative frameworks. Um, um, I've just been involved in a local matter here in the ACT where we've recently settled a matter before the ACT Supreme Court to the satisfaction of the uh, plaintiffs, who was an Aboriginal, local Aboriginal man, um, principally because the ACT Human Rights Act makes explicit references to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And also in the, in the dictionary to the Act, it also states that international law refers to the, the uh, covenants, conventions and declarations that the United Nations has made, the full suite of them actually. So um, the ACT Human Rights Act is very powerful um, as a consequence. You know, we can see that as a consequence of the matter that was settled recently um, via mediation. Um, so, and the Australian Human Rights Commission has recently released a discussion paper or a position paper on the need for an Australian uh, Human Rights Act, a National Human Rights Act. Um, it's a very good paper. You can find it on the Australian Human Rights Commission's website, um, worth a read. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, look, it's clear that among those people who are hesitating about how they'll vote, there is that view that no matter how well and good the proposal is, it will interfere or could interfere with the effectiveness of government. Now, you referred to what had happened in the context of Scandinavia, Canada, and New Zealand. Could you uh, explain how this problem of a concern about the effectiveness of government, principally by challenging uh, the fact or that the government hasn't taken sufficient attention to the voice. Now, that could result in very long, drawn out legal uh, processes. Well, okay, you shake your head, but uh, you'll have an opportunity in the moment to uh, uh, refer to that. Could you explain how this has worked itself out in those three examples you give, Scandinavia, uh, Scandinavia, Canada, and New Zealand. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll just say, first, focus on Australia first, and then I'll talk a bit more broadly about the other countries. So the, the amendment we're going to vote on, um, the wording, uh, in my view, and I guess in the view of Parliamentary Committee, the, I'd say the majority of legal experts in this space in Australia, says that there won't, the High Court is not going to find an obligation that government has to consult with the voice. So the constitutional wording is safe in the majority of the experts' opinion here, which says that there will be no opportunity for uh, members of the voice to say, you didn't consult with me and we passed this law and therefore I'm going to challenge it. So that I'd say it's, you know, that is the position this stage. You can, people can dispute the experts, obviously, but that's the position. The vast majority of experts say that, and this is, you know, leading barristers, leading judges, et cetera. Um, if that happens, I'd also say that we live in a society governed by the rule of law and every Australian has the obligation, has the right to challenge things in court if they don't like how it worked. 
You know, we all have that right. The court will might throw these claims out and say, yes, but there is no right in this case. There is no obligation to consult. Maybe the court says, yes, there is an obligation to consult. I don't think they will, but perhaps they do. But again, that is the way we want to live in a rule of law society that allows people to challenge decisions by government ministers if we think they made the wrong decision. And I don't think we should throw that away just for Aboriginal people. I think we should say, oh, all people, all Australians should have that right. How has it worked elsewhere? So I guess Canada is the most um, significant example of this. They have a duty to consult. The government needs to consult with the First Nations communities when they're contemplating conduct that will affect their rights. This happens most directly in mining cases or timber concession cases, right? Uh, and so First Nations communities might say, you didn't consult with us properly uh, when you implemented this policy or passed this or developed this mine or had this extractive license granted. Uh, and they can go all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court might say, well, you know, consultation means engage genuinely or listen appropriately. They never, and they never have, say that it gives a veto power. You need to, They don't say you need consent. They just say you need to consult. Uh, and so I think in the same case, the, very, the furthest you can get from the voice in Australia, which again, I don't think it will ever get to an obligation to consult. Even if you did, it's never an obligation to consent. It's an obligation to consult. <clears throat> so consult is not agreement. It's just engaging genuinely and listening uh, sensitively and responsibly. Mm -hmm. doesn't ever force government or parliament to do anything because we live in a society governed by parliamentary supremacy. Um, and that's been the same case in, in Norway and, and New Zealand as well. In Norway, again, the furthest it gets is cabinet needs to write down whether they listen to the voice and how they listen to the voice. They don't need to adopt what the voice has said. And the same again in New Zealand. So it never gets that far because even uh, when we're talking about the rights and recognition of, of Indigenous peoples, we always are still living within a democracy. And so ultimately... Uh, the people have their final say, right? And any government that um, routinely makes decisions for a smaller minority group will get thrown out of office, right? And so the, the court doesn't force government to always, uh, or doesn't ever give out Indigenous groups a veto power in these situations. So it's just an obligation to consult at the, at the most extreme, never consent. <clears throat> Sometimes I think it should be consent in some places when it comes to particular land rights issues, but it's never consent in anything broader than that. I hope that answers your question. Um, I would. I listened very carefully to the evidence that uh, Brett Walker and Anne Toomey gave to the parliamentary committee that was uh, holding inquiry into the bill, and to Robert French and to Ken Hayne, two of the former justices of the High Court of Australia. And I was certainly persuaded by the evidence they gave. Um, and I listened enthusiastically this morning to <clears throat> our local court reporter, Elizabeth Byrne, here on the ABC, make a commentary about these issues as well. Um, you know, when when the the High Court made the WIC decision to recognise that native title coexists on pastoral leases, um, all hell broke loose, <laughs> and it was and it was thought that the sky was going to fall in. Um, that ha that didn't, didn't happen. <laughs> um, this is not going to happen. I think if I can quote the words of um, Brett Walker um, when he was answering a question to that effect, he said, "The notion is just too silly for words." Um, his evidence is worth a read in the transcripts. Well, I, I, do, I have to say so much for the question period. Thank you all very much for your questions and for joining us tonight. It's been very good to see a significant group of consuls general and representatives of the consular court. Thank you for your interest. Mm. Around the evening off, one of our interns, Royce in Brown, Will deliver. No, sorry. <laughs> Ryan. Oh, Chung. Hong. I can't remember. Long. Long. Ryan Long. I'm very sorry. I had the wrong name in two different ways. Will deliver a vote of thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Um, well, these, these were very insightful speeches, and I, uh, I learned a lot about a, a very different um, but important angle to international affairs. Um, I know my my own studies at university usually concern um, the historical aspects of diplomacy, and the the issue of indigenous affairs has in, in the past had a had a big but often overlooked impact on the ideology of of many protest movements um, uh, throughout history, like Pan Africanism in the United States and, and nationalist movements in the Soviet Union. Um, but the, these issues are often underemphasized in in the curriculum. Um, so this this talk was was particularly interesting. Um, so I'd, I'd like to now move a, a vote of thanks for Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Wensing. <laughs>